Donald Brink, congratulations. Hmm. I wanted to bring a bottle of champagne. A little just, early. <laughs> it's a little early, but I just, like listeners don't yeah, know what time them. I'm recording. You take those two little emojis. That was, a, that was a beautiful response to the little champagnes. No how, words. That was good. How else would you respond? I mean, how else would you celebrate? It's the appropriate way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Congrats. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's, um, I can't believe we won. You really? Well, from, Not watching, that I, from watching Mick ride the boards, I thought it was obvious who was going to win, to be honest. Well, that's kind of, I, I really thought that he surfed, I don't, okay, let's just be honest, he surfed all those boards incredibly well. And I thought that there was a chance we win, but, you know, for, I'll say it this way. I didn't realize how much it meant to me that we won. Oh, okay. <laughs> Until we did, and I was like, we actually won. Why does it mean something I didn't, to you? I didn't know it wouldn't, but I don't know. You go through life preparing yourself to just do your best and move on. And like life would have moved on if we didn't win. And I think about everyone that didn't. So we're still in too. a you know that we're we're still in a good place, but the fact that we won was was it wasn't that it was unexpected. It was just it was a real gift, you know, and we got together, we did the work and Mick loved the board. That's yeah. the fact. But and the the other fact was like I hadn't seen all the footage of him riding it, and so you just it was months ago. So on the night, you know, we're sitting in Oceanside and you watching the footage, and Mick was there, and um, yeah, it was yeah, it was a little left field for me. Not that I didn't feel like we deserved to win; it was just wow, we actually did it. I felt like um, you've been doing you for a long time now. And I felt like it was a moment where everybody is coming around to recognizing what you've been doing all along. Like the board that you built here, maybe I'm wrong in this, but it doesn't feel like a far departure from the boards that you and I were talking about eight years ago. Good. You know, mm. I feel like you're still working in the same vein. You're still doing exactly what you've always been doing. And we've even been promoting at times through the podcast or whatever other little, um, project you're involved with they're being promoted to the outside world but there's only a small segment of the outside world that was paying attention or cared because asymmet asymmetry looked weird or whatever the reason was and so i felt like this was a moment of full-scale validation where it's like the outside world is fine or the mainstream surf world i should say has finally come around to the ideas and the concepts and you have a good point there in that um well, kind words, firstly, thank you. Yeah, I feel like I'm just trying to stay in my lane. I mean, I'm not satisfied with the depth yet, and that's why you keep digging deeper, but I'm fascinated on this path, and I'm going as deep as I can till I die. Fine with that. Like, So there's a, um, a comfort of that path that I've chosen, and I'm enjoying it. So that keeps the daily going, but when you, when you look at where surfing is and let's call this um the biggest stage or the largest megaphone i mean your network included but stabs platform and this video project i even think maybe maybe three four years ago the collaboration wouldn't have worked as well the reception wouldn't have been as um broad you know so surfing's in I a, agree. so surfing's in a new place and it comes from just showing up every day, staying in your lane and doing good work. Good boards will turn heads. Good boards will bring smiles. So that's the goal. But yeah, we're in a new place and it's taken um, it's taken years. More more interesting is like where we're going to be in 10 more years. Mm. So I'm excited about that. And it is kind that you say that I'm just doing the same thing because I feel like I am, you know. It's not like coming up with radical new rockers and varying degrees of craziness it's it's subtle degrees of difference to what you know works um and trying to bring the best out of it and there's we'll never be happy yeah which is, which is great totally <laughs> yeah i remember watching a video when i was a kid surf video and slater said something to that degree he's like i've never kicked out of a wave and felt like i surfed that to my fullest potential i've never been happy with it essentially i mean imagine being at a place where like well We've arrived. We've done it. You bowl to 300. Like, there are <laughs> things that you can do that in, you know? You can do it, and that's the beautiful part about the surf lifestyle. You know, like, lifestyle, art, sport, all those words are, are cute, but it's not that you're not happy. It's that it's not even that there's le meat left on the bone. Yeah. It's a, a pursuit of um, 
fascination, I guess, is the word I, I always come to. You know, like, wow, that was that was really fun. I'm fascinated by how to approach it differently. And then you age as well, which is so interesting. Like, um, take McFanning, for example, is an incredible athlete still. Um, but his surfing's in a different place. His mind was in a different place because he's not having to compete. So with an open mind and an athletic ability, but a huge history of what he's able to do when and where is, I feel, is what's moved this meter forward in this project especially. So like he comes with this technical ability that we could depend on. So as designers, board builders, shapers, whatever you want to call it, those those pairings, I know everyone was like, well, we know, we know what Mick can do. So that variable was accounted for. Mm-hmm. It was almost like going to the wave pool. You know, totally. it's going to barrel. It's not closing out. Right. And do it every time. So now you can start to cherry pick design parameters. And perhaps that was the most exciting thing about working on this board was Matt Biolis and I, we got together right in the beginning once they paired us up. And he said to me, look, we just have to make a board that Mick Fanning loves. If we do, we're in business. It was that simple. <laughs> and we never deviated. I'm proud of that. Like, it wasn't going in this direction, that direction. Everything, the guiding principle was, will Mick love the surfboard? He, and he's built a couple boards for Mick in the past, so he had some indicator. Well, this was our gift through his experience. Um, he's built boards for Mick Fanning. He knows Mick Fanning, and he had been to the Maldives. Okay. So that was the biggest, um, not point of contention, but the, 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 the biggest thing where I was really, um, I had to die on a principle was I really wanted to build this board out of EPS and epoxy. I mean, I just, I, will, I live in that world, I work in that world, probably 98% of my work is that, um, maybe 95, but... Um, Man, I thought, and especially because then on the day they give you the parameters, so they, all you know is you're working together, what date you're shooting, and then there's variables on the day that they're going to give you. So that was, it had to be five foot three or under, and they gave us the colors. So that was like, oh, well, the colors aren't great, and five foot three. So, <laughs> so let me interrupt real quick, because I heard you saying that to Evan earlier. Um, ev- everybody had different colors, but the fact that yours were the exact colors of Rip Curl's logo, I thought benefited you in this project. <laughs> not to not to undermine the design aspects or anything like that, but I was like, shoot, like once Mick puts his stickers on the board, it just looks right. Okay, it well, suits him. Well, it's not a surprise. And I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that because you don't need to explain that or defend it. It's just got to work. So I don't personally like those colors. Okay. But that what was given. So I also would like the board to have been longer. That's what was given. So you work right. within those parameters, <laughs> but everything was decided on going back. Mick needs to love this board. We know how he can surf. Matt knew what the waves were going to be like, but the whole thing was like, man, we're making a video. So the board, it's got to be compelling. It's got to feel good, but it's got to look good. So everything we did within our power was to make the board look longer. Hence the stripe to draw your eye into the asymmetry and you know, Matt and I really worked together beautifully that day. Um, and the funny thing was, you know, they came and we shot and did the whole thing, all the things you saw in the footage. And then Stab left and there was plenty of work to be done still. Yeah. And <laughs> Matt looked at me. It was probably about 1 o'clock, 1.30, somewhere around there. He's like, well, you can come back tomorrow or Monday, but we've got to finish all these things up or we can do it now. And it was kind of an exhausting day. Yeah, And I was like, no, we'll just, just get this done. I got like I I got things to do. <laughs> so we we worked till probably about five o'clock that day, and it was it was it was a special time. It was just him and I in the factory. It was quiet, and you know we cut a few more boards. He was working on details. We discussed the colors. We discussed this concept of making it look long. He didn't like the colors either. They just they it was a little stock. Yeah, I get you. And um. I went into his office and I drew, <laughs> took my, my drawing stuff out and I just, I drew four different boards and we sat down together and chose the elements that you see now. So everything was about knowing that we're making a video and how that translates. And the reality was like, I was like, man, 
I mean, this board actually looks quite naked, but the guy's got nine stickers aside or something. So right. knowing like with all that put together, it would let your eye flow. And then we had the traction pad, you know, like, so there was a balanced element of um, how your eye got drawn into the picture. But yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, backing up, when Stab first pitched the concept of the collaboration, what were your thoughts on the concept? They were kind. They hit me up and they said, hey, we're doing electric acid stab in the dark or whatever it is again. And um, I was like... Electric acid surfboard test. There you go. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Don't, mixing, the, mixing the projects. Um, or is it something you'd even be interested in? So that was the first reach out. And I was like, oh, I love building surfboards. It sounds, sounds great. And they're like, okay, well, thank you, Greg. We'll let you know more details. Then it was, all right, this year we're doing a collaborative project they kind of pitched it like, hey, it's it's like um, the music greats, you know, this person working with that. I can't remember who they referenced, but collaborative exercises, you know, they, they were trying to sell you on it. But I was like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. You were I, open to it. Oh, I, I was, I was certainly was. I mean, it's a little bit of a hmm, kind of like to build the board I want to build, but it was really good exercise to like get out of your own way and just for one, learn, but also like see if what you had is something that somebody else can sign off on. So that was step Validation two. Validation from. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and and not to forget the opportunity for me to learn because I would be working with somebody else too. So that was fun. And, and just knowing I'm a small fish in a big sea, uh, like they're probably going to put you with a big fish. So it was like, oh, this is great. Um, Scott Bass and I were talking about it on our podcast when Stab first announced the concept, but they didn't announce yet what the shapers would be. And we were both pretty much against the concept. We're like, man, it just feels gimmicky and like a novelty and the board that they're going to net probably won't be as good as what the individual shaper would have made on their own. And um, then when they released episode one, they do the sales pitch at the beginning where they're like collaborations. It's a throwback to the eighties and music and fashion. I'm like thinking, first of all, I don't think collaborations had an era that it was associated with, you know? So I felt like they were selling it hard and I was resisting every minute of it. And then once I saw the shapers working together, I realized that it was actually um, like a better way to get to know each of these shapers than even a straightforward profile piece on that shaper would be. They're not talking directly at the camera. There is a confessional element, but they aren't, for the most part, you're a fly on the wall watching these shapers communicate with one another. And I realized um, the value of the project was even if the board that they end up netting you know, isn't as good as maybe what somebody would have done, which maybe it is now that we see it. But all through the project, I was gleaning more insights from the shapers' design philosophies, from their personalities, from every aspect. It'd be like ordering a board from a shaper and then being a fly on the wall and hearing them discuss with another, you know, high-minded shaper or high-functioning shaper what that board might be. And uh, I thought it was phenomenal. Like, I really got a hand credit to Sam for seeing it through because I was resisting every step of the way, you know, as was Taylor Paul. Who, yeah, that's right. You know, Taylor, he said in his email that Stab sent out and he was head of this whole project. I'm not sure he, he clearly wasn't the mastermind, but this was his project and he works for Stab. So uh, he's the one who reached out to me and he's who I worked with. But yeah, I think that might've been Sam's idea. The reality was you're right. And I thought they did a brilliant job of creating a compelling piece in surf history. Yeah. Because it was the first time. And it's something that was so obvious that you could do it again and it would never be the same. 100%. You know, you've kind of created a brand identity with this project by creating collaborations. But, you know, it's, it's not that uncommon. This fly on the wall concept is what I'm getting to. It's not that uncommon for people to actually work with someone in terms of what design elements go into a surfboard because if you look at a relationship with a high level surfer and a established shaper i mean it's it's a feedback and a push and pull all yeah. the time so it, it's actually a dance that is it's happening on the daily the fact that it's two shapers really isn't any different if you look at a manufacturing facility that has tens of ghost shapers, which is the wrong word for saying proficient <laughs> craftsmen under the umbrella. And, and those guys are discussing things. And then with a team rider and 
if your egos get out the way, your product rises. Yeah. So it actually, I'm not sure if they forecast that and saw the overlap and let's do that, or if they were just trying to make TV, which is fair either way. No, but I think it happens all the time, really. Yeah, I think Sta- or, uh, Sam did see that envision that happening because I don't think he's just trying to make TV. Oh, he's a smart know? guy. Totally. Well, I mean, I wouldn't blame him for just making TV, no. but the fact that was compelling is because I, I, I think that needs to happen and it does happen, but to show it, yeah, to capture it, they did a good job. Well, I guess uh, good TV producers realize that tension is good for reality TV. Well, I guess scripted as well. So tension is good and getting opposite minded people in a room together is good. Right. And that's kind of what this is. 100%. And it's not tension in a bad way. It's not drama or anything like that, but it is, um, let's get two people to discuss something, you know, that they have strong opinions on. So, right. um, once they revealed who you would be working with, did you have any preconceived what the benefits might be from working with Matt or what maybe the limitations might be from working with Matt as opposed to working with somebody else? What are your preconceptions about working with Matt? Okay, let's, so let's rewind because we went on a tangent. No, there's no tangents, but... So the second part was now you're working in a collaboration. Third part was, all right, we'll let you know what date we're shooting on and then who you paired with. So that was maybe a week out, like here's your shoot date, and then a, maybe a week out they said, all right, you're working with Matt. So that was, you know, the information came through, but um, I was ecstatic, actually. I really was, and it's, I, I've met Matt multiple times. I would say I, I wouldn't say I know him, I knew of him, he knew of me, and we've always been cordial, and in fact, he had been real cri- kind and had some congla- congratulatory praise over the years of the little successes I had done and had, had made, and he went out of his way to say so, and that was real kind, but we'd never had reason to hang or get together, right? So that so he he said straight away, "What's your number?" and he shot me a text and says, "Come down by come by the factory. Let's let's go over a few things." And so I walked in the factory and he's like, "Well, have you been here before?" And I'm like, "Why would I have been here?" I mean, I um, took me on a whole tour, showed me the whole facility, which is so impressive. I mean, I love surfboards, so I'm into it, right? And um. You know, just that alone, the fact that that's down the street from where I work and live and not having, not access. You go knock on the door and you're not stealing ideas or wasting people's time, they'll show you around. Um, But like having to be there for a reason, working on something with a definitive goal is different. And it's, um, that's a big crew of an amazing family, I call it really. A lot of people working, they're they're all in the same page, working in the same direction. So to in a weird way plug into that or kind of get grandfathered in for this little thing was oh it's so much fun and it's um that was an honor so working with matt was i was really excited of course you know it's like oh things could go this way because i really wasn't worried about that i hope that we could dance together i keep using the word dance because it really is you know you you move and go and flow i didn't have anything to prove so long as the things we chose were in a direction of a good board and let's be honest his brain's on the line his name's on the line too and he wants to do the same so that was honest it was pure let's make a board that mick loved was our north star and never wavered what'd you learn from him i learned a few things um when it comes to the design details in the board i pushed hard you'll see it in the footage but i've pushed hard on um the fact that they limited us with that size length on the day yeah we had a couple little things we were going to work on. He's like, oh, maybe we can go in this direction. I made something like this for Mick, but you don't know, right? So once they put us into that category um, of the smallest board, uh, everything was out the window. So we really started from zero, and um, Matt had a chassis that which we tweaked from. That's okay. how it like, sort of works on the computer. And I pushed hard on volume distribution and the deck line. Um it was it was funny. He's like, I would never do that, you know. And I'm making him move the mouse. It was cool to see. I don't. That's not my world. I don't see that come alive. And he's like, I would. Oh, he's like, oh, I'd never do that. And move things. He's like, you know what? Actually, it looks that yeah, that flows because you could. You know, we both know what we're looking at. And eventually, we. Just, I was like, I I work in full scale. I, I I can't. He's like, let's just cut one. We'll look at it in full scale now. 
20 minutes, cut a board, and then looking at it in real scale, I was like, whoa. It was really exciting. I was like, yeah, that looks right. Because you know boards, right? You, mm. you know curves. And watching that disconnect, he's so used to that. So he was with a familiarity of where distribution would be and how much we're pushing it. But I'm like, hey, we got to, we got to keep this short thing on rail longer. And so I pushed real hard in that decline distribution, also knowing that we couldn't have embraced the EPS and epoxy world. So that was something we discussed and kind of went back and forward. And his point was, look, I've made boards for Mick. I've been to the Maldives. It's, it's probably going to be windy. And I was like, I get it. Makes total sense. I'm willing, like, let's embrace the poly. So we went down a poly route, which was um, very, it was a wise choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and we cut that board and it looked really good. And I learned, back to your point, what was what did I learn? In the design principles, there was, um, you know, everyone's got a way they do things. And you, I heard you guys mention multiple times, like, oh, you're so surprised how a pro can pick up a board and be like, oh, this is a this one, this is a that one. And, you know, when you're around boards for that long, but there are nuances. It's the way, um, and it's usually like, they'll, you chalk it up to like the finished edge or the tail, rail tail shape or that kind of thing. And there is, you know, there's certain de- things that a designer will depend on and not mess with because of the variable that they have control of in other elements. So if you lock that up and have a consistent dependent variable there, and usually that would be like the the volume or the, the, the tail block dimension, meaning like how full the rail is through the fins and aft. Um, so there were things like that which... Um, I wouldn't say I learned, but I saw how Matt depended on that as he balanced other things because I saw them come to life together with input that I either had or watched come in. Um, so from a technical point of view, that was um, interesting. And also to see it in a cut file format, this sounds so obvious, but when you're only used to seeing boards in blanks, then shapes, then glass, like finished boards, versus screen, cut ribs, finished glass. There was one more stage with your eye get to see lines in a new way. I, I learned things from that just because I could see it. Fascinating. Very fascinating, but it's like available to anyone. The more ways you get to see surfboards, it's helpful. Yeah. So I really... This sucks so silly, but I just I'm not around machine cut boards. Right, uh, didn't spend years scrubbing them, and so that was really fun to see that in a new way. Same thing in a new uh, one more facet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned that, and then as things progressed and evolved and developed, and now we have a full production model. I pinch myself. It's really um really proud of the board. Yeah, because it makes shown that it works, but. When you see it and feel it through the size range, I'm excited, man. People are going to do some of their best surfing. This will be one. This will be many people's favorite surfboard. Amazing, and that is amazing. So, when you bring that into it, I've learned. I mean, there have been times when I've had to read up what words, and they're usually business words, <laughs> mean in emails. <laughs> I learned. Good. <laughs> Amortized. Yeah. Didn't know what that meant. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still not sure I do. But <laughs> right, <laughs> something about distribution of funds over time as sales progress. Um, but I'm, I'm, I know I'm talking long, but I've learned so much, and I'm continuing to learn. Um, you know, one thing I've learned about Matt Biolis is, I think people were surprised of, oh, he's got to collaborate. That guy's got a history of collaboration, maybe more than any board brand i mean let's if you just quickly go through the things like i mean he's working with um ipas now he's done the firewire thing he did um does libtech uh mr uh countless like accessory brands it's it's you know a brand of that size he's constantly working with people so his ability to um, get what they want and embrace and 
facilitate somebody who they're working with was nothing new. I was in the deep end on that. Mm-hmm. Can I work with someone? Was And I knew that going in. I was like, all right, just shut up, stand your ground, and let's make some good work, you know? So, yeah, that was good. But Matt's a, Matt's a cool dude. He knows surfboards. He's into it. He's done a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's a great point. He's got nothing to prove, but he's got a lot to defend, and rightly so. <laughs> you want to keep going, right? But I think a lot of people... They just waste his time. So of course, he's like you don't. Everyone's got the same amount of time. Everyone wants to be friends with somebody who makes things they love. It's kind of funny. It's like those aren't real friends. They just they're just a nuisance, really. Mm. So you know, like someone of his level would would maybe come across in an interesting way to some people out of context. But he was nothing but a pleasure to work with, and he was efficient, and I appreciate that. You know. It might look like I have more that time than him, but it's just I'm choosing to use it differently. Totally. And he's a family man. It's cool to watch him interact with both his kids and his wife and spending time with them a little bit in these events now together. It's I respect that. That's great. Yeah. Can you explain further? You said deck line, volume, distribution. What does that mean? And what exactly were you trying to achieve and what looked funky to Matt? Yes. Um, Terry Martin was a dear friend, and gosh, I miss him every day. I really do. But he always said, building a surfboard is pretty easy. You cut the top, you cut the bottom, and you roll the rails. (laughs) It was cute. Sounds easy. (laughs) Yeah. But to his point, um, and this is how I approach shaping a surfboard, is... um, you want to, if you're making a spoon, you make the inside of the spoon first. You get it just right. Then you can control how thick the outside of the spoon is because it's easier to cut away the round part than the convex part, right? Convex, the concave first, the convex out. So what that does is set you up to, for one, if you're shaping polyester, stay as close as you can to the skin or the crust of the blank and you're getting a harder board. The closer to the shell, the harder the board will stay, so therefore lost. So that's just um, 101 for how to shape. And most people, you know, you, the bottom contour would be um, something you really want to get right. You've got singles and doubles and channels or whatever you're doing. So people chase after that. Um, but, but if you can get the deck line, meaning the curve of that inside of the spoon, exactly where you want it, and then turn your board over and bring the bottom down to it, you have way more control. So I, I, I set this up to say where the board is thick and where the board is thin is probably the most understudied part of how boards work. But when you ride a board and you're fitting into a wave and steering it, um, you know those boards where you're doing everything right, your arms are right, even you're down low, you're looking good, and it just won't do what you want it to do. Often you're fighting where volume is. Now we want volume, foam's your friend, those things, right? But those statements can be uh, misstrewed when you say, well, this board's um, comfortable to ride and paddle, but I can't overpower it. Or I'm always overpowering it. So you need... Let's use a word support instead of volume right now for this. You need support in the right places when you're pushing against the board on a wave face, when you're um, redirecting a board and are able to stop directing it. In other words, not oversteer it. So there's pushback that you're getting through the volume of the board or the support that we use the word now. And when you say support, where the board's thick and thin makes more sense. At least I've thought that better way to explain it so when you when we were put into this real small category i think mix short boards are 20 i think it was 28.7 or 27.8 around 28 liters right we knew that Matt made them um the goal was i mean it wasn't as cute as just keep the volume the same and put it in a different place but that's a quick way to say it. So what, what we did was, when I say move the deck line, you can't just make the board thicker overall. But what we did is kept the board thick enough for his sensitivity to be 
fairly normal. In other words, not giving him a three-inch thick board with sexy ends. You maintain that volume and you carry it all the way through. And really, that's why there's a beak nose. Imagine a full rail that just doesn't stop would end up in a double V end, a rail meet rail instead of rail fading, getting thinner into a short board tip. <laughs> so that's all it was. But it's um, it's it's brave only because you're putting support or volume or foam up forward that when you're coming through a turn, there's there's a different sensation of put pushback. Not necessarily where his foot would be placed at all. It's forward of that. Exactly. Okay. And even a word like swing weight is, I think, a bad choice in this description because the board was already short. So that was unique and different. So I like to think of things as how does this balance what we're trying to achieve? Because compromise is meaning like you're dumbing something down, but you, if you can constantly elevate and bring things up till they've got balance levels and, and they're interacting or playing off of each other. That was one thing, you know, um, standing in that shaping bay and making decisions and from what we kind of were thinking we might be able to do and then having them change the variables on the day. And Matt looked at me and he's like, what are you thinking, Fins? And I'm like, 100% thruster. This is a thruster. It has to be for this. And and he was like, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, good. And that was a really fun moment. There were little hurdles he had put in the path. And he was like, what do you think on fin measurements on this? And I was like, 10 and 7 eighths, 3 and 3 eighths, quarter inch toe, 1.13 off the rail. Yeah, good. It's almost like, okay, yeah. my boy, you, you're yeah. okay. <laughs> and so there were these little um, hurdle moments, and that was one that I felt like he was like, okay, this this guy might know what he's doing. And <laughs> um, back to the deck, real quick. Yep. I think of, I hear what you're saying, and I think of um, decks being pretty uniform. And if there is a part that nets a thinner volume, it's usually taller at the spine or at the stringer and then kind of foils down towards the rails. Are you saying that there's actual um, differences on either side of the stringer in thickness in relation to the asymmetry? I shape that. I definitely do. Um, Because it was Mick Fanning and we knew what he was able and wants to feel... (laughs) Um, the board couldn't be outlandishly wide. And if you do, there becomes too much curve, like the, it goes out for too long and then comes in and you start surfing these you know, pumpkin seeds. Um, so the fact that we stayed conservative in our width, overall similar in our thickness, you carry the thickness toward the rail and then we had a sharp, it wasn't a chine, but it pulled down pretty aggressively. So we maintained volume out toward the rail, but then what I did was pushed us forward so it it, maintained it toward the nose too. Okay. So that flatness, it wasn't a flat deck, which ironically we learned he doesn't like, which kind of makes sense. It goes all the way out and as the nose starts to lift, so does it carry its, its thickness through and then die into the rail. And that was my point about wanting to embrace the down rail is so that all the way from the tip through the toe, through the heel or toe, the entire rail didn't have um, varying degrees of um, sinky, sticky, forgivey, drivey parts. There were fewer gears. It was one flavor. It was this down rail shape all the way. Gotcha. Of course, it tapers the way the board's distributed, but to lesser degree than, say, a short board. Gotcha. So what you're doing is when you come all the way on a tippy-toe drop, you can depend on the the rail sensation being familiar no, no matter which part you're on. Yeah. I think you could explain that or see it best served in, say, like a gun. Someone taking off. There's a picture of Kelly Slater. I think it's the. I think it was 1996 at YMA when he won. I remember that. And it's like he's I coming. The photo you're talking about. Yeah, you know, and it stuck in my head because it was the best way to describe how the outline, the rocker, and the rail shape served. And he was all the way on tippy toes, but he had used. I think it was a nine six. He was riding. Okay. It a one hundred percent of that nine six was being used. And so I was like, well. 
he's going to use 500% of this 5.3 on a head and a half high wave because it's the way it's going to fit in the wave. So that's why it was a, a cohesive choice and we needed to pack the volume in. So. Yeah. That, as you're talking about that photo, it just flashed with me. Do you know the Munga Berry photo at sunset on the peak where he's taking off like that? He I has don't. a similar, I'll, I'll send it to you later. Those fo- photos look so similar to me now. As you said that, it was almost like transposed on one another in my head. I think um, what's becoming more clear every day that I get to work on surfboards with surfing, I say with surfing because it's not just my surfing, it's other people's surfing too. <laughs> the smiles happen when you get on rail and are able to stay on it. So if if the and, I, and that's not that's not expressed in the daily. <laughs> Wake up, get on rail, right. sleep, <laughs> repeat. <laughs> so you know when you look at compelling surfing or things that you think you want to do, or when you do things that you know feel good, it's like when you're on rail. And so that's true. It's like breaking things down just to those most basic elements. It's like okay, can we be on rail? Can we stay on rail? And and that's when good surfing's happening. So the whole. I think a driving force and for me the asymmetry is so important because well you drive those rails so differently with the body mechanics of heel versus toe so but the goal is still can you be on rail and stay on rail for as long as you want or need Mm. to and that was where the need came in like the tippy toe free falls um I think Mick surfed those boards all incredibly well but it was really hilarious when you see the lineups and sometimes there were people in the in the lineup Everyone shoulder hopping compared to where that guy was taking off. But totally. those waves were lumpy and windy. And I was just imagining myself in the Maldives going, wow, these waves are hard to surf. I was doing that too. So like, that's a tribute to Mick and his incredible athleticism. Um, yeah. <laughs> Boards need to fit in waves. If you're comfortable doing so. You'll have fun. Yeah. Or you'll move the meter or you'll make a nice movie. movie. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, tell me more about the design that you guys ended up on the final board. Final board. Um, so, y- yeah, it's – this board is designed as a thruster. So, you know, the fact that you put thin boxes in doesn't mean that you can't – you don't want to police what people do. And he wrote it as a 2 plus 1 – but then, you know, all those fins didn't arrive. So that was kind of funny. The, the whole project was, and that's a fair playing field because everyone had the wrong fins in the board. Right. So, you know, but it's, this board's designed as a thruster. It's actually a very simple surfboard. The fact that we kept that down rail means that the, the rail is fairly down and that's what the 80s nuance really is. I know. I haven't even picked up the board yet to feel, but that's the same vibe I got from watching it. Okay, so... I'm glad you picked up on that, but that's what 1980s was doing, was full of boards, down rail, and those boards have a lot of speed, a lot of sensitivity. Sometimes they can be too sensitive. So in short, the board's simple. It comes in, it's got a down rail, the beak nose, which means the rail mm, the rail shape is somewhat similar throughout, and we talked about those gears. And then it comes in, and essentially it's a double ender, meaning like the nose and tail are very similar in its dimension. It's not overly wide, and that's its strong point. If you went too wide on this board, it would be really cute to surf, but it would just get in the way. Mm-hmm. Make no one board in the way. So I think that's the bravery and is maintaining its conservative width, which I am I love narrow boards. They may be harder to ride, but they fit in the wave better, and they make you surf. They elevate your surfing really quickly, and then you connect the dots, and you have more fun. Yeah. So it's not overly wide, um, and that volume is distributed fairly well, but for people, they need to remember that we were challenged to make a board, a small board for a good surfer. So if you order one, you need to remember (laughs) this is meant to be a small low board for you, but it's still comfortable. So that was fun. And yeah, it's pretty simple. It's got a little flat entry, goes into a single concave. There's a soft double through the fins, but there's no V. Okay. And that's exciting. And that's what lets you put a thruster set of fins in. And not to say anything of V would be um, ill, but I would know we would have put the fins in a different place and maybe embrace something that could have used a twin trailer setup. Yeah. 
and people will do that. That's all fun. Have fun. Try experiment. It's easy. But the design concept was a matched or a contemporary thruster setup with a wider tail block because the board's small, but it doesn't go overly wide. So you get tons of speed and drive, and yeah, it's a fun surfboard. Um, so Mick normally rides for his pointy thrusters. Is it five ten or so? That's the spec I got on the email. Um, I looked at a couple of boards in down at the last factory the other day, and I, th- I think there was five nine and a half and a five ten, and so right around there. But so, and then you made this for him in five three per the uh, yes the assignment. So, for a surfer listening who's going to go buy one of these, and they normally ride a six zero, let's say, would you recommend they buy a five four, five five, or just yeah, okay, yeah. Um, kind of reference mix stats. I'm just saying because Mick's such a great surfer, is it will he then be able to ride a smaller board? Should the average listener scale up a little bit? I know or, they will. Okay. <laughs> well, should they? I mean, what are your thoughts? I don't think they should. Okay. And I'll tell you why is because remember when I said that if you put volume in the wrong place, there's too much coming back and you're doing all yeah. the right things and you can't understand why you you can't overpower or you're always underpowering a board. You know, you want enough foam in your surfing experience to make you do the things that you need to do or want to do comfortably. If you put too much in, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do or it won't be comfortable. So when you look at volume numbers, Oh, just add a few more liters in to make it more comfortable. And yeah, it'll paddle better maybe, but those the technique of unleashing what you're supposed to do is going to be, I'm not sure you're going to do that. And so it's cute, but it's not accurate. So you think of it of just needing enough foam to let you do what you're supposed to do. Surfing's hard to begin with, so don't try and make it too easy by just adding all these things because they're actually going back to hurt you. Um, I made... A five five version was well, five four and a half, and I did so intentionally just to feel what it would be like um, on a plus size. And um, the board was super comfortable, but could easily. I actually want to ride the five zero. Wow. Okay. But in decent waves. Yeah. So Mick wasn't surfing knee high waves, and often we do. So, oh, I'm rambling on. Choose what sounds comfortable, but don't be don't be nervous to 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 this is a, this is made for you to have a small board in your quiver, and that's why I'm excited about it because there's often a hole in people's quiver. Like you got all these short boards, and you got your step ups, but in the tiny realm, and I love tiny boards. I mean, I got my bookends are right. way, you know, but this needs this needs to be one of the smallest boards, or maybe the smallest board that you can do performance surfing on day in and day out. Right. That's so certainly different. your smallest thruster. I believe so. Yeah. So seven inches, let's say, off of what you'd normally ride from a pointy thruster. I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but the size range that we designed is 5.0 through 6.1. And um, they all feel really good. The um, the literage, it sort of goes up gradually, but then they are, it sort of starts to jump. So you can look at those graphs. They'll be on, um, well, not graphs, but the tabulature. They'll be on, uh, I think it's loft surfboards, not net, dot net is where yeah. it'll be going. But um, yeah, you can choose accordingly, and it's pr- it's pretty obvious. But to that point, choose a board that looks comfortable, but don't forget to address the width rather than just the volume. Think about what's comfortable width-wise for you. There's plenty of volume. It's, you 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 catch a nice wave. But think about width. Got it. Um, you talked about being working mainly with EPS and epoxy. Can you explain why and how you've come to that conclusion? Yes, yeah, so I've been I've been start to finish for for years again now. There was a time where I was outsourcing glassing, but yeah, I've been a bunch of years now just back to start to finish, and I build all my boards that way. And there was a few reasons. Um, I got really sick from working with polyester when I first started like 20 years ago back in South Africa, just bad ventilation, no masks, you know, I wanted it so bad. And I, I personally got uh, sick being exposed to polyester day in and day out. So, you know, I'm not saying that's that way for everyone. For me, it wasn't. And so when I, 
on a rare occasion I expose to Polly or go to it. It's just, I, it's, it's not comfortable for me. So, you know, working with epoxy resins, um, it changes the way you have to do things. It slows things down incredibly, puts the price up. Um, and it limits some aesthetic ability or um, options out there. So there was a transition where I was kind of frustrated by it, and I can tell why most industry don't embrace it for many of those reasons. But then there were also incredible benefits of things I was able to do with it. And those things have let me have control over elements of a board that I now enjoy. So I feel like I'm lost when I don't get to use it. Mm. And I feel like my hands are tied both as a designer, being a board builder. In other words, like you can forecast how this is all going to work because everything needs to be cohesive. And when you're thinking about the craft, embracing the whole thing needs to be addressed. And for me, I'm like, well, no, I can do that. Even if it's only aesthetically, those elements matter. But being in that epoxy world, um, locks me up but then also frees me up to be able to do those things which then means if you're only shaping EPS you have to do epoxy but I can shape a polyester blank and embrace my construction finish with epoxy uh, resins so just playing with things and, and um, I started to meter and measure the board's resonance um, and actually the frequencies of each board and that was a fascinating thing and started to chart and measure and meter things and watch the boards wear and started to chase these frequencies that started to sound magical in the board. You know, those boards that just have that sound. And that was a personal experiment of just like, can I chase these things? And that consistency day in, day out, post-bake curing in an oven, these boards with epoxy, it's been really rewarding. So now it's, I don't, I don't really want to make a board a different way just because I know what I can do with these materials and the boards are working and they're lasting really well. I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> when you say, you know, when a board just has that sound and you're chasing frequency. You're the only person I know <laughs> who chases frequency and what sound. Nah, there's many that know what I'm talking about. Well, tell, explain it. Let me... Um, what sound are you talking about? Like flicking the board when it's finished or the sound... Yeah. It, okay. The way I me measure them is I bang them on the ground, and I with a guitar tuner you can actually see the frequency, the boom, 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 whatever it is. You know, like there's um, hum, that's about 196 hertz just from memory. But you know, you can there's there's a sound that a board has. In other words, if it's doop, doop, it sounds dead. It sounds dead, right? So we don't want boards that sound dead. And I just know the boards I love. The ones over the years, they weren't the dead sounding ones. So if they're more pingy, then that might be something that was worth chasing. So that was the little path that I set out to measure the frequencies. To be honest, I, I chased the wrong thing. I think you could have a fairly low frequency in terms of how the note that that board rings at, but the resonance, meaning how long it rings, is actually the better measure and so I wasn't measuring the wrong thing. I think I was just chasing the data in the wrong place. Because if you've got a 6.2 or a 6.4, well, the 6.4 is longer, the note will be lower. It's a longer guitar string. So the fact that it's, you can't just, unless you're apples and apples and everything's the same length, but there's a varying quiver. So it's more about how long the board has a resonance of its tone. Um, epoxy is really helpful for that. It, I... It, it's so much harder, which can be brittle, but it's got this ability to not crack out on itself over time is what I'm told. But when you've got a thinner version of something that's harder paired with really well woven cloth, that's the way it's woven. And that's what you pay for, which is funny. You can't see it, mm -mm. but you pay for it and it makes a difference. So things like S cloth and directional and the way you put them together and the way you glass the board um, and the steps taken there, <laughs> it's, um, it's a little laborious, but uh, it's working for me and it's it's working for other people and that's why it's exciting. Um, back to the sound. Yes. Uh, obviously, 
you're, you, I mean, your hands are going to mute it. The surface that you hit it on is going to change the sound. What environment are you creating this sound in? Is it on a rack and you're using like a little tuning fork? Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? So if you hit the fork, the fork would ring. So I hold the board and hit the nose and then the board. So the board is the tuning fork. Hit the board on what? The floor. The same floor every time? Yeah, my factory. It's just concrete. Okay. People freak out. I mean, I come in and I'm like, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Oh. Like, no, it's, and it's, hopefully they, well, it builds trust. They're like, they freak out as they're bored. And I'm like, no, no, look. And they check the nose and the nose is fine. Um, I've heard the sound of my boards hitting concrete too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, look, it's, I mean, this isn't a, there's a consistency in how I measured it, but it was a more of a fascination and you can watch these things and I, I charted them all. And, but what it is, is you, you can be on a beach and pick up your friend's board and it feels good. You know, they under the arm tip, it feels good, but it's also, you can feel it if it's dead. Mm -hmm. So there's my point. If you, if you measure it in a somewhat calculated way, you're going to be somewhat accurate, but you can feel it. You can hear it. You can surf it. So that was why I chased all those things. Um, the The funny thing is, when you pick up a surfboard on at the beach, in a shop, in a garage, out in broad daylight, you can see things. You can see lumps and bumps, and everyone can. Um, you know, in a shaping bay with a controlled environment, with the lighting, in a glassing factory with the controlled lighting in a sandy. When you've set yourself up to have control over those things, you can see even more. So I always challenge people, like don't say you can't notice the difference or you can't tell the difference. If you can see those things on a beach, then in a shaping bay, you can see them even more. So mm -hmm. that's like you, you control things as best you can, but at, at, at some point you just let feel take over. Trust your eyes, you know. it's um, That was probably the most fascinating thing is cutting the size range. Like I said, I didn't grow up scrubbing boards. I don't do that, but um, it's been really fun. I, I jumped in to help us get production going here, and Matt asked me to, I mean, I've scrubbed a ton of these things now, and it's been really fun to look at the range as she goes from 5.0 to 6.1, and you see the, the inherent design staying yeah. in there. But, you know, and you can, you just trust your eyes. You can see these things, and it just looks right. And we made a couple changes. I was like, oh, there was there was an issue on one of the one of the boards. I was like, it just doesn't flow like the other ones. And uh, th that wasn't my world. I was like, hey, Matt, like, can you please just look at this part of the file? I, I'm not quite sure what it is, but and he, and he did. And it's really interesting, you know. I mean, you just scrub it out and you'd fix it, but you want it to be captured yeah. and, and right. And so, yeah, it's really exciting to see that. Um, in regard to EPS and epoxy, you talked about, the benefits of it from kind of the build aspect, the construction and the longevity of the board. Mm. What does it feel like in the, or why do you advocate for it in terms of uh, what you feel in the water? Cause that's the kickback I hear often from surfers is they'll get an EPS board every once in a while and they have one or two in their quiver, but they just like the feel of what they're used to right. with PU. So what's your thoughts on riding them? Um, you like the feel of what you used to is good, which means that if you're going to redesign the wheel, essentially, you have to make something feel even better. And I think a lot of people building boards with EPS and epoxy are trying to make them feel as good as poly or to to tune them down so that they feel like what they used to. And, and that's cute, but why not make it feel like something absolutely, not different, but, so much better that you can't do without it. And that's kind of the mindset I chose. I was like, I'm not trying to mimic poly. I'm trying to elevate boards. And that means that there's a room and a space for poly and it's a horse for a course and you choose that on that day. But if you're going to choose EPS built this way, it's going to feel this way. So I embrace what it lets, the feeling that it brings and then I try and design and control that. So all that to say is um, I will and do ride poly boards, but I'm having such good success with how these boards feel for me that they work. And so when somebody comes, I need to give them something that when they ride it straight away, they love. 
and they can't do without it for that board and then they can choose when they want to ride it so if you're trying to dumb down not dumb down is the wrong word but if you're trying to dampen and try and um, get the springy livey pinginess out of your EPS board that might be a disservice to what it can actually do because it will feel different so I feel like there's place for both I feel like even just from the manufacturing price point let poly shine in its poly poly realm right and um, yeah you're going to pay more and it's going to feel different but if you love it that's great I do and it's harder to make, but I'm staying true to it because it's um, it lets me do what I want to do, design-wise. So yeah, it's um, the way I've gotten there has really actually got to do with how the boards get glassed, and I'm doing a wet-on-wet lamination, meaning I'll lamb the bottom and straight away lamb the deck, and there's a fusion, and then it gets baked in an oven, and like the way it all just comes together, it's this cohesiveness that when it all works together, just like what surfing is building boards that stay on rail and let you get there comfortably. Like that's the, the coming back to this, like North star. Um, but I, I think that a lot of boards are built too light when they're doing the EPS. It's all like as light as you can and then trying to make it as strong as you can with a hard shell. That seems a little backwards. I do embrace the most dense EPS I can, which is usually a 2.3 pound. So there's a difference there and there's a reason why a um, mechanized industry wouldn't embrace that. But I do and because I'm hand shaping, I can kind of control that and slow down. But I've had good results and yeah, it, it works. Do you want to guess when the first time that you and I recorded an episode together was? Do you have any idea? I remember the day clearly because it was a, I want to say it was a Friday, but we were scheduled to record and then you were up at, I think, the Surfing Heritage with Dick Metz or Cole Ekstrom or somebody and you were running a bit late and you text me and he's like, oh, are we still good? I was like, oh, we could go Monday. He's like, no, let's do it now. And you were just so efficient and we jumped on it. And okay. uh, I don't remember that. that. Uh, yeah, it, it, so we did it on a Friday afternoon and I just, that was just a cute conversation. But man, that thing lives on, right? It was... I would guess it was seven years ago. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um, we published it in January 2014. I had to look that up. But we probably recorded it in 2013. That's funny. I would think. Yeah, it's... So even longer than seven years. Yeah. Eight or nine. Um, that makes sense because I remember some of the boards we were talking about and they were sitting up in a in the rafters as story. I, I'm not very personally attached to boards. I just they come in, they go out, you know, and yeah. My wife always encourages me, yeah, there's a couple you need to keep. Maybe they'll be helpful in a story one day. And I, I, I try and whatever, but there are a couple that are sitting around. But to me, like less boards around is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was uh, how I remember how old those boards look. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, the reason I ask is um, I want to talk about how the business has changed in that eight or nine years and uh, kind of the economics of board building in 2022. And... Um, are you building the same amount of boards that you were back then? I would imagine now with this big win, you have a deluge of potential orders coming in and you could, <laughs> you could ramp up production if you wanted. So how has it changed since we first talked and um, what yeah. are the economics of it? Yeah. It's, it's funny. It's changed in that, I build way less surfboards, way less. And um, because I went start to finish years ago, that was actually the driving force or the driving dictator of that. Chasing enough sales to make the business work for me um, was very difficult, you know, making sure you had enough orders. Then you got to manage all those orders. So, you know, you can't just up the price and build less boards, which makes total, that's be the easiest fix in the economics. But um, there was a choice for why and how I decided to embrace that. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to shape in, you got to get your reps up. I felt I needed to, I'll just speak personally. I wanted to be shaping, shaping, shaping as many boards as like you just, the more, the more you shape, the better you get and the more proficient and accurate you can with the planer. And for me, I knew I wanted to stay on that, um, meaning being on the planer and design accurately and 
and um, with a variety of kinds of shapes, you know. So for me, it was like just, that's why I was outsourcing the glassing. I was like, okay, well, just as many boards as I can shape. And I was shaping a lot of surfboards. And the price point was, um, I thought, fair within the market, but it let me get numbers. And eventually, chasing that many numbers to make it work got exhausting, but it also wasn't a strong business plan in terms of if things slow down or controlling the amount of time you have every week. The less sales you need, the better off you can control those things. So years ago, going start to finish, figuring out how to be able to control the aesthetics of my boards the way I was wanting to gloss them and stay glossing them, and I meant that with the top and bottom, weight on weight, fabric inlay, all those things were there for a reason, and I wasn't going to mess with them, and I still won't. <laughs> I always look for something better, but that's all, that's what you get when you order for reasons that I can or can't explain but that's what you get, and I believe in them. So going start to finish was, okay, well, now I can only do so many boards, so it was pretty easy to write the economics. I'm like, okay, well, if I charge this much at so many boards, that might make sense so long as I only need this many customers. So my line out the door got real short that I needed, and um, then COVID came, and it was uh, I was probably the only person who didn't build more surfboards. <laughs> and it was a smart choice in hindsight, it was a little risky at the time because who knows what was going to happen and nobody did, right? But, you know, it was for the first time I had a bunch of orders in a pile printed out in front of me and I could just go to work every day and build the board, not worry about building that line. And what it did was let me um, polish my technique and how I was putting them together um, let me control those elements from the frequency and the oven temperatures and all those details involved in every order. So that was um, an opportunity to have enough volume to not change the way the boards were built, but just focus on the actual boards. That sounds silly, but it was really not so much, are we going to have, do I have enough work to do? It was just doing the work because the work to do was there. So that was a, a good time um, I, f I sort of put together a workflow that was manageable and looking forward the workflow I'm anticipating is going to be half that wow and I say it boldly because I was doing two boards a week for two years straight I built 104 boards start to finish one year I built 107 boards the next year now they weren't all sales some were team boards some were personal boards a lot of personal boards and I was testing things, trying things. I designed, I hate the word model because everything's handmade, but they're references. So I designed a few references. One was called the Hat Rabbit. It's a triple channel, asymmetrical board, round nose, be beautiful board. I have had good success with it and feeling like um, the, the little landscape within which I can move and measure it in terms of length, width and volume and how much to push and pull it from a kid to an old dude to a pro to where you're comfortable and also physical limitations so I designed a few boards that i was hoping to be able to have within the wheelhouse and keep for a long time so it was that one and then the, a new board called the moonbeam hideous looking board entirely designed around how to surf it's like a surf training board really oh okay uh, we'll get back to that if we want but um looking forward i was like okay i want to make less surfboards and one of the reasons was you'd need less orders to make the business work. People come to me because they trust what I'm doing, but the boards work and last. And the problem is it's like it can take three years for somebody to come back with the board they love and order another one. So building a clientele was it's both difficult, but also the boards are working and lasting so long or still lasting. And so now you're building a quiver, not just replacing a board. And that's not my strength anyway, and that's what you want to do, or I wanted to do. So that was those choices, and um, the reason I want to do even less surfboards is, you know, there's opportunity to, I'm not less interested in surfboards. There's just other things that I feel like are important at this time in my life to, to start to bring in, and things like furniture and jewelry and stuff like that, which I have been using within those 107 and 104-year boards. 
I was working on some portfolio pieces. So none of that's really dropped yet, but I have been working to expand the the offering. And it's not so much about the offering, but you know, my my daughter and my son are getting to ages where working on those things with them or seeing them being built around their lives is important. And to me, I was like, yeah, they know I can build surfboards and that's available if they want to tap into that. But what about welding? What about woodwork? And so, I don't know. It's a, it's a bit of a weird business plan, but I, I'm a one-man show. I'm starting <laughs> to finish. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to build less surfboards. I'm going to do these other things. I want to, I want to, there's a few things I want to do, but I feel like if this business plan can work and we can live a simple conservative life for the next eight years, like this is, my kids are getting old fast. They're eight, and, no, 10 and 13 right now. So that's sort of like the loose rough plan for the next sort of eight years. It's a, I mean, it's a life plan first and the yes. business plan is secondary. So I try to be smart with it. Yeah, I could build a lot more surfboards. Every single person was like, man, just put a few on the machine, get a model, get some logos, it all. It's not that I don't respect people that do that. In fact, I respect the heck out of them. I just, I don't want to use all my time managing surfboard production right now. Yeah. That, if that's the simplest way I could say it. I'm gonna let this trash truck. I'm gonna get some water go by. So, uh, 30 or 40 minutes ago, you did a great job detailing the value and kind of the learning that you had in the factory at Lost, hmm. the value of the factory and that production, and also what you learned. But you're still building boards by hand, and uh, for good reason. You also did a great job explaining that. I'm curious, for the mixtape model, is there anything that is sacrificed by these being made in a factory as opposed to being made each individually by yourself? Well, it would be bad marketing to say yes, and it would belittle our partnership. The difference is what's on offer right now, as you see it, is um, polyester construction with a stringer. Mick wrote it, Mick loved it, and it worked really well. What it does do is let us get boards in retailers around the world through this network of lost surfboards at an affordable price for people to love and ride. And what an honor to be part of that, to let people experience what we both title as a very subtle asymmetrical surfboard. So it's built stance specific. So left foot forward, right foot forward, goofy foot, regular foot, designed to work or help you surf the way you stand. So the... The difference would be is, you know, in a, obviously we'll watch how sales work, but in an amazing world, I can dream of this in varying technologies with EPS, maybe fancy tech, those kinds of things on offer. And like I spoke to earlier is I embrace the elements as a cohesive design part of a surfboard so you're tapping into their strengths instead of trying to make everything feel the same so this is a base entry option we're really proud of it Mick certainly liked it and it works well but i do think that there's opportunity um for varying offerings in um, customization customization only in the materials really there is something beautiful for just locking things up and this is what it is and this is how you get it. And that's why I encourage people, look at the width before you choose the volume only. Keep it as narrow as you're comfortable to ride and maybe one step back. This board, it's going to work, it'll fit in the pocket, but just try and ride as narrow as you possibly can sign off on. And this brings up a point that I've been around surfboards for quite a while and you know, there's power of marketing, there's power of name brand, there's power of the logos. I've seen, you know, when you down at the contest and so and so's riding the this and that model and you're like, that's not that model, but it's what they're pushing lately, right? We've all seen that. I've seen it very closely. Um, I kind of I kind of thought that if this board went to production um, we would sort of tweak it and make changes to make it a little more commercially relatable or easier to surf and man i respect the heck out of matt biolis that this <laughs> nope i've looked at everyone this is exactly that surfboard 
obviously it's remade uh, with the manufacturing but um i really respected that and the, like you can go buy a 53 and surf like mick fanning yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a i mean that's that's a cheeky way of saying like it's actually really a good way to be able to fill your quiver with something that you probably don't have on that smaller side but there's relatable surfing that you can go and try and get to new places and then go back to your other boards and they'll work together right and that's why i was really impressed on his choice to stay true to what they we call in the OG which is like the original one is the 5 foot 3 and the same colorway and people sort of fall in love with that aesthetic and also like the 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 new one story that stabs told but it's pretty cool the um Part of the Donnie Brink experience, though, comes with very specific customization. It's more than just a board. And in the one that you provided for Mick, it, you provided quite the array of um, accoutrement that came with it. Was one of them an actual cassette tape? Two cassette tapes. Two cassette tapes with a Walkman. My question is, what was on the cassette tapes? Here's the playlist right here. No way. You've got the playlist. <laughs> yeah, we got the playlist. I was wondering what these cards were. Okay, so this is just a business card with, you know, the logo, Stab's logo, and a QR code. So is it a Spotify list that pulls up? So that's a Apple Music playlist. Okay. So um, stay tuned because we can probably make it available through the show notes, but I do believe that Stab is going to be doing extracurricular story on this and they wanted to share that and i was i thought it would be better for them to share it on their platform than my my apple music you know okay and m many people listen on spotify and i think there's other options in a global territory that might be more convenient for people so yeah. they're researching that right now i've redesigned that and waiting for their qr code so got it. it it'll come out in the right way but yeah there was so when we started this project um the reality was i, I looked at matt and we're standing in his office and i said matt if we just want to watch McFanning surf. I think our job is to build B-roll. They're making a movie. Great and he's point. like, he's like, man, I couldn't agree more. And I was like, I have a couple of ideas that I think we can use to sort of get in Mick's head. We got to, we got to capture this guy. I mean, he's arriving on set and he's getting given six surfboards. Like, it, think about yourself waking up it's the day before your birthday, and somebody gives you six brand new surfboards and say, go have fun. Close your eyes and imagine that. Like, it's, it, where do you start? Exactly. So this guy's now, he's on. He's he's under the pump. He's got to look good. He wants to put good surfing out. The cameras are rolling. So I was just trying to put myself in that position. Like, what would this feel like to get six new surfboards, let alone one, and have to perform? And so I said, look, we need to find ways to grab this guy's attention. Like, to really, we're pushing ourselves. We really, I mean, you pushed ourselves design-wise with within what the field that we had to work with and then um can we ask him to do the same matt laughed and he's like just do your thing run with it i love it so yeah i made uh made a ton of little things that we could kind of present with the board so that the package would be something that sort of grabbed his attention and whether that story was told or not things matter yeah, and when you paddle out a surfboard that was gifted to you, if it came as a gift with this credible detail to your nuance, like this was built for you, we built this board for him. So it it was um it started with those '80s references in the first emails that they sent about the musical collaboration, and it it uh, I I started working on all these art details and it just jokingly was a sort of a working title for me was became the mixtape <laughs> mick fanning mix it's it's so clever mixtape but it, which, it's uh, almost yeah. so obvious but i wouldn't have thought of it myself well you know i'm working on all these things and it's like well you know when you open a new folder apple new and well, what do you what do you call yeah you need something yeah. so it became mixtape then and and it sort of grew so what what happened was um because it was sort of the working title became mixtape it was um, the art direction. I felt like, you know what, we, we're telling a story, we're creating B-roll. If they use it, cute. If not, that story's there and it's, in, and it's inherent. It's in the, in the whole process. So that was 
pretty obvious that Mick was, I think he's around 40 years old. He would have grown up in the 80s. Your friend gives you a mixtape. And this is funny because I'm speaking to people and they're maybe in their 20s, don't, haven't held a cassette. They don't know that nostalgic <laughs> value, which is not... Little thing, even like the cassette, as soon as you they showed that, you were doing that, I was thinking of the sound of the cassette tape closing. Exactly. Little things like that. Yeah. It just had such a great little sound, you know? It, it, it absolutely did. And so I was thinking about, okay, how do you capture someone's fascination in a time period like that? It got down rail with an 80s beak nose. Yeah. So the whole thing sort of sort of stemmed on itself, stemmed on itself. And um, so, yeah, there was a small Walkman, two cassette tapes. I made this playlist. And the playlist was really, um, there was some, some new music to sort of take you out of context. There were some Australian bands that there was no way you would have known unless you lived in Australia. But they couple bands that I've been following that I was really impressed with and I'm pretty sure they would be hot on say like Triple J in Australia so I was like oh let's play with those because you'd think we're Australian I thought if we posed as Australians that might be something that was helpful endear, you, endear them to you yeah a little bit so there was like these like weird cult Australian bands that I really enjoy and then um, Matt had some input of some he's like oh the hoodoo gurus were in one of these surf yeah, that, that he would like he, that would take him right back to sort of surf film from from totally. from high school, post high school. So he had some input on that, and then I took him down the just just an absolute absolute meandering path. And it was a lot of times I chose songs that um, either were clever or just good songs or palate cleansers. But sometimes they were um, like songs that you know from parts of your life, but you maybe never listened to. Like the Friends soundtrack. Okay. Have you listened to that no. whole song? No. You can now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of... <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I even knew it was an actual song. I thought it was just the theme song. Yeah, the little things like that. I was trying to like, like who knows where he was would have been in his life at that time, but it's um, it brings you back to a time with a sensory uh, connection. So that's what it was. And then um, there was a a small little notebook looked like a passport, but I'd uh, carved, I'd do a little, little bit of leather work, so I'd carved this cassette tape on the front, and it was something to collect his thoughts, for, like take notes on this board. Just silly, but it suggested like, hey, like we're looking for feedback. Um, the cassette tape, there was a set of headphones, I made some FCS fins. So FCS2, well, FCS were part of the presenting sponsors of the trip, so they said like, oh, you and your board has to have FCS fins. So I was like, okay. I love hand making fins. I've done them for years, but hadn't made a set of FCS twos. Um, gosh, that was probably the hardest thing, and pushed myself, but pulled it off, mm. but all by hand. Like had a little Dremel, and I mean, they snapped into the board. It was so with that satisfying yeah. click. But I did them with a eighth inch um, G10. Yep. So they had that real high-tech flat foil inside, and then I got to feather that leading edge and actually turned it into a 90 foil with the wood back. So they had that sort of nuanced plywood feel that I love, and I do like making the plywood fins, but if they're not glassed in, the flex can be cute and actually quite desirable with that full foil at times, but this is Mick Fanning on a small board. The guy's going to be pushing so hard and then uh, balance that with his uh, Mick Fanning trailer. Because the foil would have been too thin with the um, yeah. the wood, so it had a set of fins, the book, the cassette tapes, um, covers for the cassette with the art direction. Okay. Uh, what else was in there? The rack of smokes. Oh, really? Yeah, and and oh, there was a letter. So it was a letter to make and then like. And he read it. We thought they might read it on screen, but more than anything, just to be like, hey, we pushed ourselves. Push yourself with your surfing. Find new lines. Like, try and get to places that you're going to be proud you went. Um, and then a little bit of a description of the things we put in there and a uh, pack of smokes as currency for a taxi driver or That's a funny. boat fare and... Yeah, you know, just little things that you f you pick up along the way as you travel the world, and like that's currency in a third world, totally remote, ocean going place or a prison. <laughs> anyway, I don't smoke, but it seems like a cute way to connect, right? Um, 
yeah and so that was that was fun what else was in there um uh oh i took the off cuts from some eps and um turned it into a block cut and made repeat patterns on um, a little bag that it all went together in and then a board bag just so it was like this cassette thing this the theme sort of kept ringing true and bringing it home and then i'd made an asymmetrical traction pad and one of the biggest reasons was to tell the asymmetrical story i mean mick fanning knows surfing and surfboards but it was also like hey we're creating b-roll can we tell that this is a stone specific surfboard so called up creatures of leisure who is his you know his grip sponsor and they sent me just boxes of grips and cut those up and created a rotating arch. So it was one pad fits all. So you rotate it with this offset arch system, go to your heel on one side, your toe on one side, spin it around if you're goofy, spin it around if you're regular. And uh, it came out really nice. It looked good on the board, but we knew all these stickers would be on there. It was a way to balance it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a, it, it was a multi, um media art project really from sound to vision to the whole thing you know it's yeah pretty fun it was incredible i was so impressed by all that thoughtfulness but also not surprised because i've seen all the work that you've done over the years so well thanks yeah it's um it's kind of it was really fun to have something to sink your teeth into and be like all right well it's got to love this board and well, if we're storytelling and you're capturing someone's imagination you use everything you got but it's got to be um the best part was it was unannounced, undefined, unlabeled. Like it was just letting the art do its work. Yeah. Like you choose a song. Well, you choose the wrong song. It's the wrong, <laughs> right? Totally. So you, if you if you chose the wrong direction, it wasn't that it was going to come back and bite you, but it wouldn't serve its purpose that it was chosen for. Right. So it was kind of fun and like no strings attached, no labels, no nothing. Just will this art do its work? But at the end of the day, we want to watch Mick surf and of course. gosh, he surfs good. Um. I'm curious how often you ride other shapers surfboards. Very often. Oh, really? Yeah, I for years when I was just wanting to shape as much as I could and still I actually just to back up and segue here, I, I really miss not being able to hand shape as many surfboards as I do. Like down that down production meant like, yeah, you know, on a normal week I'm only shaping two boards right now. And I miss just those reps on the I love shaping surfboards. So I do miss that, but um with those years of just shaping as many, you, you're just trying to ride as many boards. And I'm never happy with the boards. I'm never going to be happy. I'm always trying new things. But I have made really conscious effort of going out of my way and not just using a session to try something new, but to try other boards. And it's been a really fun exercise in riding all kinds of things. I bought a bunch of used boards, fixed them up. And mm. just, to, just to try things, I wanted my son to be around other boards too, like seeing really old single fins heavy boards poly boards um i restored this um ipas sting it had 167 dings on it <laughs> the artwork was right there mm -hmm. told us tells the stinger story mm. so you know little things like that we brought into our life and it's just they're there i'm not explaining it to them it's just a brain fake see if that rubs off but um writing yeah a lot of old vintage stuff and then um i have been writing uh, other shapers boards like kind of working on feedback with them which is how hilarious I, I learned more about what my surfing is and how those elements are and it's a board I didn't have to make interesting and it's not a critique it's just a it's fun it's surfing so I've been doing that a lot um, riding a couple of mayhems it's I would imagine so fun and it's you know I I just love surfing. I love building boards. I love building things is what I'm realizing more than anything. And boards, because of surfing, make sense. And it's probably, well, it is why I started building boards. But I just like making stuff. And when you make it less about you and yourself, which, I mean, we need, we don't need more of Donny Brink in this world. We just, we need more of sh moving things forward. And that means collaborative, but together and figuring out things and, helping other people if I can give input on their boards if they want or I'm learning about my surfing that then you can help with other people's technique and that kind of stuff is more free giving and more um, rewarding in the long run and that's been the focus in the last few years really. Mm. Yeah. It's 
What a segue. It's funny that you say we don't need more of Donnie Brink in this world because I got a message from somebody last week. Keith Grace in New Jersey wrote, quote, finally watch the final episode of the electric acid surfboard test. Clearly the world needs more Donnie Brink, <laughs> more than just his work on surfcraft, dot, 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 end quote. What do you think he meant by that then? Yeah, those are kind words. It's, um, well, I'll take you on a segue right now. <laughs> so, no, um, I, I think good boards make the world a better place. So that means if they bring smiles and they're good surfboards, let's talk about that. So it doesn't matter who's building them. That's a good thing. Costco dropped the ball. They're the biggest world manufacturer of boards and the boards aren't the best boards in the world. Imagine they were. What an amazing landscape. So, you know, it gives us huge opportunity to make better boards. My point is, um, I can only make so many surfboards and there are judgments on how I choose to run my business because I could be making more and affecting more surfers. Like, and those are really kind words, but it's not that I'm too cool to want to do that or too controlling to want to give those pieces of control up. And this has been a great exercise. Like, like this well, is at least that won't blow around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> This has been a great exercise and like, you know, you relinquish every airbrush, fin placement, like there's a lot of control gone, but you know, there's, like I said, it's a family of people excited about building surfboards around the world and hoping they're having fun doing it. That's really good. And you get to buy one and go surfing. That's fun. So, you know, I can only build so many surfboards. I want to pour my best energies into anybody's board that I get to build. And I really look at it that way, the board I get to build for someone because I have so much fun building it. And when somebody comes to me and trusts me with their aesthetic um, detail, their surfing experience, like what you're actually building them, and then the even the dimensions and elements at play, you get to guide and not tell people what to do, but they essentially trusting you. And I take that really seriously. So I get to build those boards, which for me is such a joy, and there's only going to be so many. But, you know, sharing story about boards, about how boards are built, the fascinations of how surfing is important, because I really feel like it is, that's where things like the podcast comes in. So how can you affect more people than just the product you sell? Um, well, apparently you can collaborate with brands and sell more products, which is cute, but more than that, you can um, redesign a traction pad and now creatures are making one. Are they really? Hold the I was phone. wondering if they were, yeah. Yeah, and they've been really cool to work with, but, you know, these are design ideas, and, you know, I, I love designing things and building things. I love making things, as I said, but, you know, I think there's opportunity to um, maybe put some design ideas forward that can be affordable or available on a bigger scale than just the boards I'm building, at least for right now's focus. So I'm not looking to make more surfboards, but more of me, I think... Um, I think I have some ideas of how I can bring more of others out with uh, my production, meaning the podcast's a great idea, and I'll tell you, I'll share right now the story or, or the project I've been working on that way, but like things like a podcast, this conversation affects or has potential to affect many surfers with zero cost. Right. And so therefore that rising tide of if we're moving forward, if we're elevating surf craft, surf design, surf enjoyment, surf responsibility – Everyone benefits. Mm. And that to me is a service. Um, it comes at a toll, but it's fuel for me. I, I really enjoy it. I, feel, I don't feel like it's a duty or a calling. It's just, I get to do this? I get to build. So, this, I mean, it's, I still can't believe we won. Yeah. Do you see my point? <laughs> I do, of course. I'm like, it's, I really am so grateful. And I'm also, um, take it quite seriously. For years, maybe too seriously because your self worth so tied up in it, and you just want to, you just want to do it, or you want to do well. And yeah, now it's like, man, I get to do this. This what a what a joy, what a what a blessing. I think um, what Keith, I'm presuming, but I think what he might have meant uh, with the world needs more Donnie Brink, and not just in regard to surf crafts. I think what came across in that video in the stab piece is a real kindness and a real thoughtfulness that we don't see very frequently nowadays. And uh, especially with the way that social media propagates 
and the things that the algorithm promotes and all that kind of stuff, it tends to be the opposite of those things. It tends to be just like whatever's crass, whatever's offensive, whatever is sensational ends up becoming popular. And so to see you walk into it, just being super thoughtful with all of that additional things that you provided Mick for, um, and then also your kindness through your interactions with Matt and just all of it was like, gosh, it's so refreshing and the world needs it now. Yeah, I mean, it's always needed it, but it needs it now. And it relates back to what I started out by this conversation with, which is you've been doing the same thing all along. You're just you, you know? And like the culture has changed and the surfboard culture has, but the greater culture as well. And you just keep doing your thing. And so it's great to see that um, it fly the way that you are flies in such stark contrast to the way the culture has become. But the value of it is highlighted in that contrast, I think. Very kind. Thank you. Um, I think the wisdom in that would say, if you just stick to who you are, just be you, that doesn't, doesn't matter who you are, I think it's going to be well received, but you, you won't, be as insecure. Look, we're all insecure. The best place you can find yourself is just being 100% you. Right. And if that is done to with utter um, authenticity and um, earnestness, what you have to offer will be genuine and well-received because people can see themselves in that. They can't see themselves doing that maybe, but they can maybe see the urgency with which you bring it or the... Um, <laughs> For me, the meandering parts I take on which to arrive somewhere. It's way more, there's way easier ways to build a surfboard. In fact, we don't even need more surfboards. What are you doing? And mm. I'm like, well, it's the way I've chosen to spend my life. And so I think if that's one thing I've really, I've looked at it. So I don't ever want to tell people what to do. You want to ask questions that make people think about what they do. Because at the end of the day, everyone's going to make choices. But Great I feel point. like if you can just, find what makes you come alive turning it into a career is oh, maybe the worst advice you can give anyone right but if yes. you know what makes you come alive you can design your life pretty well around being able to do those things either often enough but you can find this part that you can balance where the energy is coming from where, where's your joy like i think the concept of um defending your joy is uh endlessly interesting to unpack like if you look at a uh, somebody deep in their work it's interesting because you're like you're fascinated by process but you also look at the the overarching curve of how they got there and how it's changed and how it's evolved and you can transpose that into like any other um valid path yeah i agree so for me um going back to terry martin he was an incredible shaper, but the fact that he did the same thing for 52 years or whatever it was since 1952 to 2017, like the fact that he just did the same thing every day was so fascinating. Like that's what the film I made was about. Like that's kind of cute, you know, like it's uh, just be you. Um, these things have really showed themselves most accurate and true from having children. They're not children anymore. They're growing up every day. So you start to think about them really deeply. And yeah, it's um, encouraging them. You guide them morally, obviously. But encouraging them to be themselves seems most valuable because then they'll have less insecurity. We'll all be insecure. But that less, they'll know where they are. Find a north, you know, and, and be able to not be accepted in the world, but just stay the course. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Good. I I don't want to be right, but I think those questions are worth asking and they seem to be true when you try them on for size or you ask them of someone else or you challenge the concept. Like, I think that's, I don't even think that's wise. I think it's just a good question, you know? Yeah. Um, you referenced a podcast. Uh, we could take a break if you need to. That's fine. Okay. You referenced a podcast. Yes. Um, tell me where is and what is the status of Swell With My Soul? All right. So um, let's start with an apology first to all the listeners. So uh, years ago, quite a few years ago now, I guess, um, 
I started a podcast under your network. It's the Surf Splendor Network. And um, so it's called Swell With My Soul. I think we've got somewhere about 50 episodes out there. And um, yeah, so so kind for people to listen. To be honest, the the goal was to once again ask questions. And it's it's something to share that's more about um, share and offer more than just something that you're selling, like the product or surfboard, right? So for me, it was a, uh, a study of that. Um, and I never looked or metered or measured who or what was listening. It was just trying to stay pure and honest and just showing up and doing it. And it got to a place where I thought, you know what? I need to take a break from this. Just like there was just, the, we don't need any more of me. It was really a concept I was thinking about. But, you know, take a break and, and taking a break from it made me realize, man, just showing up and talking about what was going on within, not my world, but the world of boards, designs, rails, and rocker, that kind of thing, from week to week was fairly interesting, actually. So it led me to start to believe that, man, I work alone, and sometimes as a board builder, you can think that you're all alone in this, and there's no one to look over or across to and ask questions of. And that came to our point of like in these bigger manufacturing facilities you know these shapers are cross-referencing between themselves and with their riders it's a beautiful dance with and you can see these things and and it's really a team effort well i don't have a factory or a big facility so you can kind of feel really isolated and um and you know that saying or that concept of being the change you want to see can be so um quite challenging really so i thought you know what i'm going to try something so i reached out to ashton pickle who's a local board builder he started as a customer came to me asked me to build him some asymmetrical boards he took one board around the world with him there's a board i made him it was incredible and it asymmetrical board surfed I mean, all around the world, he's a really good surfer. He came back and he was like, thank you so much. That was one of the, that's the best board. I think it's still his second best board he's ever ridden. Wow. And really an honor. He still has it. So, but he's been building some beautiful twin fin. Called him up. It was last December. I was like, hey, I got this idea. Let's get together. And if you're in, interested or willing, like, let's, I don't want to tell you what to do. I don't want you to become me. But let's see what you're working on. If you have any questions, maybe we can unpack them together. But let's create a little environment within which to study things like a Petri dish within which you can have your learnings and maybe we can share those and others can learn too and we'll learn together. So I was like, I don't like the concept or the word of mentoring, but just don't feel like you're in this alone. I like what you're doing. I don't want to change it, but perhaps we can share that and others can glean from it. So we did. So the pause on the podcast is actually, we've been recording so much, I just haven't been putting things out. And so that's what it's been. It's been a pause of um, uh, transmission, but not of production. And so that will be coming out December. <laughs> you said it out loud. Now you have to hit the deadline. No, but it's fine. The work's been done. So right. every few months we get together. So we surf together every week. I've been writing his boards, part of writing other people's boards. And man, it's it's been really, really interesting and rewarding. We've got a bunch of rare episodes in the can. And the best part is we don't know what's next. And I go, all right, well, that we learned. So well, now we're going to go into this. And I just let him like, okay, what do you want to learn next? And it's not, what do you want to learn from me? It's like, what are you trying to find out? And it's just putting a focus on somebody else's path. Because he probably is asking those questions of himself. Mm. Me asking that question of him makes him ask it in his own words, in his own brain, and he's answering. I'm, I'm not putting anywhere. I'm just, I'm just a guy with a microphone, really. Yeah. And we've become pretty good friends, and we've shared some really good surfs together, and that's fun. But the, you know what it is? It's on the off, off days in the wind, nobody around. You know, surfing B spots on, on a crowded lineup, and just down the way, just doing our own thing. And um, my concept for that. And stay tuned because that'll drop in December um, under the network. But it's so hilarious that I was feeling like uh, I know what it feels like to be alone within the board building world. And it's not that everyone's competitive or competition. 
I just certainly am not. Like if my 100 boards at best a year is a threat to someone's business, that's hilarious. Right. But then this opportunity came with Stab and it's almost like I have an open door policy over at the Lost Factory now and I can walk in and ask critique on a rail from Matt Wallace. What a gift. Yeah, crazy. So that came to me, but not that I know more, but I was just willing to offer that to somebody else. So the concept is... I'm not even sure what we're going to call it or how we're going to brand it and this network will be part of how we get it out there but I just dream of any shaper being able to talk to another shaper and share not even ideas and it's not even always about shaping it's just about life but knowing that you have a kindred spirit as board builders or shapers or airbrushers or laminate whatever it is but I feel like this concept of um uh, community is the wrong word the concepts of uh, sparring partners maybe training partners somebody to just to elevate each other accountability is the wrong word find your words put them in you um, that could be something that is not uh, promoted but thoroughly enjoyed once tried on for size so if we can we yeah me and you listening can um, take that and and apply it within your own town. Man, I'm really excited. I mean, look at the effects that this collaborative project that Stab put on. Agreed. Made a compelling surf history piece. Totally. Um, honored to be part of it, but imagine all the people that didn't get to be part of this 12, hopefully on the next ones. You don't need Stab to film this thing. Just go and right. work on a board with somebody. Yeah. Cool? Well, I'm excited to listen to it. Yeah. The, the podcast I'm, exci- I'm excited to share it and... More than anything, the concepts of work together, share stories, walk a lo- walk a road together. You learn along the way. So, yeah. Um, final question for everybody: What was the last surfboard that you rode? That one right there. That's the, funny. I actually the always, mixtape. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, th- important details. I almost think. No, I think I got them. Where do, where to buy these boards and how to buy them? I talked about looking at the size range, but they, I believe, October one start becoming available through the Lost Network. So lostsurfboards.net, I believe, is the website. They will be available in stores at the Catalyst uh, Surf Shops. Um, production globally, I can't answer for all that now, but I believe it's in the works. So so that's Saturday. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can, get, you can get those boards, and so proud to be part of that. I am going to be manufacturing the same board, but entirely through my process by hand start to finish aesthetic details will vary um just according to those kinds of things no logos just the way i do things um that's exciting i rode that board yesterday and it was it was really fun was it is that one eps it's eps yeah it looks stringerless eps yeah it's um Yeah. You know what it is? It's a, it's a word I've been trying to embrace throughout explaining surfboards of, of, of late, but think about boards that don't get in your way and you forget what you're riding. And I think that was maybe one of the biggest um, lenses through which I watched Mix Surfing because I felt like he wrote all those boards really well. But if you can think of your own surfing, how does it apply to you? I feel like, can you surf the wave, not the board? Those those times when you just forget what you're riding and you're just surfing, that's the goal. Yeah. And so if a board's comfortable for you to apply your technique, which hopefully is growing and getting stronger and lets you do what you're supposed to be doing at best or want to do um, creatively, then that's, that's a good surfboard. So a board that lets you do that comfortably is the goal. Um, yeah, that board was very refreshing. I could, As I said, I could easily... I'd love, you know, order a five oh. I'd love to ride the tinier ones, and I'm most fascinated to ride like a five eleven six oh because I do feel like people are going to over order the volume just to be more. And I I get it, but I I can't wait to feel a plus size board for myself. How that would feel like where the diminishing return will be like. Okay, well you can only ever push it this far with yeah. my small frame. Right. So that's going to be interesting, and I look forward to that. Never, you're always learning. I mean, what's the point if I you're not? No, I get it, though. Uh, well, I'm anxious to fondle these two boards to pick them up and feel how they feel. Mm. So 
Thank you very much, Donald. Wait, wait. I need to use this opportunity to just, hey, like, it has been amazing to be part of this exercise. I'm really honored to be part of this conversation in surfing, Netherlands surfboards, working with Matt Biolis, Stab for the platform, you for this opportunity. Um, I am a one-man show. Like, I've had some more emails than I'm used to managing, so <laughs> we'll get back to you. Can't build everyone's board. International shipping's a nightmare. Like, I just... Think about who you're working with. Maybe go down and talk to them about the surfboards that are most comfortable for you and make you come alive. But if I get to build one for you, that's great. If not, go and get these where you know to get them. But I just, yeah, I, I got a lot going on right now. So patience would be appreciated, <laughs> which sounds so pretentious. Well, but no, uh, what's it, funny is I was thinking about what your turnaround time would be for boards. And I don't know the answer, but it's probably not that different than big factories. You know what I mean? Like everybody's. Yeah, I'm a small one guy. I'm a small thing. Like it's these my boards aren't for everyone. And if you resonate and want a vibe, and it sounds like something for you, and you love it, that's great. And we build up a customer who keeps coming back. That's fantastic. But more than anything, I think, um, yeah, I, th I think just not getting too far ahead of oneself. I what what I actually I really like to do is if somebody puts an order in, it's like okay, but you know, often people want to talk on the phone, which is the best for me. But you know, if we can talk on the phone on a on a Saturday, I will draw that outline that day and just make that board. I don't want to, oh, we chat, and then two months later, right. I'm like, wait. What, what? You lose the essence of it. Yeah, like, wait, where were we going with this? So, you know, having that front of mind, so just managing that flow is, I'm just going to have to be a little more creative with that. But, hey. <laughs> That's a challenge. I mean, it's a great problem to have, to be honest. Well, you design systems to work within the way they're working, and now all of a sudden there's an influx of interest, which is such, I'm so honored, and that's great, but, you know, it's like, well, the systems fail because they weren't designed to, wait, this many messages? And, and you don't, you want to connect with people and, and uh, give them time of day, and I think that's the most important, the people that you do get to, is to yeah. do that. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Well, this conversation has been overdue, but this is a wonderful reason to bring us back together, so thrilled to catch up with you yeah likewise i really i listen to all the podcasts i'm about three as i said i've been really busy i'm about i haven't listened to darren's one uh of late um i'm a couple outstanding but yeah i love your work i i feel like your service to surfing as a whole and your access to people and their honesty within their own path is so fascinating. And like I said, you just stay in your lane. Yeah. And to hear people's stories within their own lanes, um, man, you learn. I, I, I learn so much as you go. And it's a great thing to listen to while you're building boards because it's, it's all board centric, which is so great. But it's more, it's human centric. Totally. And that's such a gift. I mean, I know you resonate with that, you know, like you I've learned people. I, I've learned to. I mean, for a long time, I tried to lean into the surfy part and the board part. And then I realized the human interest part is actually more interesting and relevant and relatable to everybody. Um, and it's what we often don't get to hear from the surf luminaries who we love, you know? So yeah. I'm comfortable there. I like I like working in that space. Well, we, we're people, you know. I actually never use logos on my boards, but, you know, kind of had to bring stuff out for this, but the, <laughs> the logos actually bring surfer boards. <laughs> you, I, yeah. build, I build boards for surfers. Like it, I don't, this, the ocean doesn't need them. Surfers need them. And, and this is it. Well, always I listen to your work and know that it's like we relate as surfers as like that's the, the, the sort of kindred spirit and that, but it's human to human and that's important and necessary, right? Yeah, totally. Right. It's the most important. Right on, Donnie. Thank you. Thank you. Always.